Forget the naysayers. Using a trading simulator is one of the best tools you can use to learn to trade, become a better trader, and avoid many of the problems traders develop, which end up doing almost irreparable damage. <coughs> this video is going to be the ultimate guide to using a trading simulator. It doesn't matter if you're a complete beginner or you've been trading for a while, I guarantee you there will be something you can take away from this video that will improve your development or performance as a trader, if you actually put the things into practice that is. So why did I start the video by saying to forget the naysayers? It's because a lot of people who claim to be experienced traders will say trading simulators are useless because there's no jeopardy. A big part of trading is the psychological aspect and simulators just can't replicate that, not in the same way. In fact, there was a particular comment a little while ago which made me laugh. The person said, learning to trade with a simulator is like learning to swim in a bath. Now, although funny, it's actually not true. You see, there are phases that you go through to reach a high level in any skill, and for a complex performance skill, which is what trading is, the phases are knowledge acquisition, skill drilling, simulated performance, and then real-time performance. And that's the same for other performance skills, even those with a strong psychological aspect. So why would learning to trade be any different? The problem is you have so many gatekeepers of trading who want people to think that they have some sort of hardened mindset that you have to learn the hard way. Just like your grandparents who had to walk five miles in snow to get to school and you just have it so easy these days. But this is just those traders trying to make themselves feel more superior over beginners. It's an ego thing. Let me tell you what happens when you do learn to trade in the live markets with real money. When you're a new trader, you're obviously going to have poor risk management and no real concept of what makes a good or bad opportunity. That means you'll inevitably be taking big risks. Neuroscientists have shown that our brains process financial threats in a very similar way to a physical threat and a risk in the market is a financial threat. So do you know what happens when you go through those big risks? You experience a minor form of trauma. Your brain is overwhelmed by emotion, whether good or bad. If you get lucky and the trade succeeds, you've unexpectedly made a large amount of money. Your emotional processing becomes overwhelmed. And likewise, the same is obviously true if you lose big as well or burn out your account. When our emotional processing is overwhelmed, we can often develop conditioned responses to certain stimuli that should otherwise be neutral rather than triggering. This means although part of your brain will react consciously to those things, you also have an unconscious element which creates an automatic response when triggered. At the time, it might not seem like a big deal. You're still learning, you've got all kinds of other struggles to deal with. But the real problems come later in your career when you feel like you've finally got the skills to succeed. But at that point, you just can't understand why you're still taking these actions that end up sabotaging your trades. Moving your stop loss when the price approaches it to avoid taking a loss, which only ends up making things worse. Closing profitable trades too early. Revenge trading. The list goes on and on. Basically, the same exact psychological issues that the anti-trading simulator people claim you can only learn to overcome in the live markets. Well, guess what? That's also largely where they developed in the first place. So using a trading simulator is a great place to start learning because you can develop the necessary skills as the first step before eventually moving to the live markets. It allows you to develop implicit knowledge, which you can only get through experience, without also developing conditioned responses as a result of trauma. And for more experienced traders, it allows you to collect more data and experience different market situations that you weren't there to trade in real time. To give you an analogy, this is like preparing for battle by going through basic combat training, wargaming, or tactical training. Do you think wargaming or firing blanks at people has the same psychological impact as a real war? Of course not. So why does the military do all of these things? because it allows you to experience different scenarios so you're better prepared for when you face them in real life. You can create a plan and a strategy and test how valid they might be. Yes, it's not the same psychologically, but it still puts you in a very good place to succeed in the real situations. And this actually relates to another development problem that lots of traders have. They constantly encounter situations in the live markets that are too challenging for them. They haven't made the right adaptations to be able to deal with those moments. Well, with a simulator, you can create unrealistic expectations that force you to adapt. 
Just like training in a smaller boxing ring so that in a real competition you feel like you have all the space in the world, by creating tough restrictions in training, you'll find the real thing a much easier situation than it would be otherwise. It's all about pushing yourself to adapt. It also means you can collect a huge amount of data. Most traders think that they have a profitable trading system because they've had profitable results, and then they wonder why over the long term they only end up losing money. The answer is that their system was never profitable in the first place, it's just that they didn't have a big enough sample size to realise, they didn't have enough trades to actually see what the results are overall, because small sample sizes have a lot of variability, and this can be misleading, it's the law of small numbers. A trading simulator allows you to gather the right sample size without having to waste years of your life doing it. And finally, it gives you a way to keep improving even when the markets are shut. The trading simulator is always there, night or day, 365 days a year. Now, back when I was learning to trade, I did it in the live markets. As a result, it took me years, not only to become consistently profitable, but then to also make back all the money that I'd unnecessarily lost. I wish I had a trading simulator back then, and I wish I knew all of the things that I'll be teaching you in this guide. So I'm going to walk you through how to use the simulator, what sort of practice sessions to do using it, how to use it to help develop a system, how to use it to collect data, and so much more. And instead of you having to waste your time and effort trying to choose the right simulator out of all of the options out there, I've saved you time by putting a link in the description box to the one that I use and that I highly recommend. I've tested many of them out, I even used an alternative for a long time, but for many reasons this is the one that I think is head and shoulders above all the others. So go and check out that link if you want to. You'll also see that we've added chapters to the video so you can skip around easily however you need to. If you've already got a simulator and you know how to use it, you could probably jump ahead a bit. And if you're not convinced by now that using a simulator is a good move, this probably just isn't the video for you anyway. But if you are convinced and you're ready, let's get started. Okay, I'm going to assume that you already know how to download and install the simulator, so we can skip that step. But after you've installed it, you'll now need to download some data, market data. Now, which data you choose to download will depend on the markets that you trade and how you trade them. For example, if you only trade using the higher timeframes, you probably don't need all the tick data. Therefore, you can choose the other options and save yourself some time and disk space. Since there's such a huge amount of data available, it can often end up being quite a big file size. Therefore, if there's anything that you're not going to need, don't bother downloading it. Likewise, there's no point downloading every possible market if you know you're not going to use them. Just stick with what you need. You can always download more later if you need to, if you change your mind. Now, if you trade using the lower timeframes, like the one minute, five minute, 15 minute charts, it's probably a good idea to download the tick data but then you should limit how many markets you use to avoid it taking up so much time and space. In this case, I'm going to focus on just one market for now, so we'll download 10 years worth of data for Euro dollar. This will allow me to use the lower timeframes and the higher timeframes, because if, for example, I want to use the weekly chart, one year is obviously going to only be 52 candles, so if I want to analyze structure and other long-term moves, I'll need a good few years in there to show enough of the market moves to actually analyze it. Now, depending on how you trade, you may also choose to add the news data. One of the drawbacks of using a simulator is that you can't process the incoming news and fundamental analysis, at least not in the same way that you would in real time. You're obviously looking at things that have already taken place. So when I'm using a simulator, I mainly just focus on the technical analysis. So the overall fundamentals don't matter as much to me. However, I do have a step in my system for my technicals for what I call negative filters. We've talked about that before, you can watch a video up here if you want to. So these are things that warn me not to enter a trade, that there's higher than normal risk, or to reduce my position size, things like that. And one of those negative filters for me is when major economic data is due to come out, since that will change the volatility in the market and it may disrupt my trading. So with that in mind, having the news data available inside the platform will help me to realize when those moments are coming so I can choose the right decision with my trading, rather than having to find like an old economic calendar online and cross-referencing against that. That can be quite cumbersome. So having it inside the terminal is much better. Okay, so now our simulator is pretty much set up. Let's go through some of the key features that you might use. Now, obviously, if you're using a different simulator to the one that I'm using, then this is going to be different for you. But if you want the same one as me, as I said before, you'll find the link down below in the description box. 
When you're learning to trade, you eventually want to get yourself to the point where you're unconsciously competent at it. That means you know what you need to do and you can do it as if it's second nature. You don't have to consciously think through every single action. Now, we often imagine that when someone is highly skilled at something, their brain must be constantly active and processing things. But neuroscience shows that the truth is, beginners have more neurons firing all over the place, and as you become more experienced and more skilled, you have much less activity happening in your brain. This is because many of the actions that you take become automated, similar to like when you develop habits. Our brain is amazing at figuring out ways to conserve energy because it's so metabolically expensive that it has to. So if your brain automates frequent actions that it takes, it gives you more mental bandwidth to focus on important things, such as understanding the context of a situation in the markets and devising an appropriate strategy for a particular trade. With this in mind, something that's overlooked by most people when it comes to developing as a trader is getting really, really familiar with your tools, almost to the point of obsession. That's one of the reasons why I've stuck with MT5 as my main trading platform, despite it seeming painfully out of date compared to some of the newer platforms, it's because I know where everything is, how to use it, I don't have to think about it, it saves my cognitive bandwidth for more important things. So whenever I hear about traders changing their platforms, their tools or their work environment every few weeks to keep things fresh and interesting, it's sort of like, tell me you're not a consistently profitable trader without telling me you're not a consistently profitable trader. So if you want your best performance in the simulator, before you start doing anything else, make sure you become intimately familiar with all the functions that you're going to need to use and set up any hotkeys or customizations that you think will save you some time and energy. Let me walk you through some of the main things you'll need to know. Nobody wants to be looking at ugly charts. So one of the first things you might want to do is to change your chart template. Now, as you can see, I've got custom colors here for my charts. And the way to do this, if you right click here in the middle of the chart, go to chart settings, then it's just like other platforms you may have seen in the color scheme. You can change all the colors here. You can go to the settings and change whether you want, for example, the grid to be showing and things like that. And also you can add any indicators that you might want to use regularly. Like for example, I have volume here at the bottom. And once you're happy with the chart that you've got, you can right click again, go to templates, and you'll see the different templates you have here, or you can save a new one. And when you go to save it, you obviously put the name in here. You can also choose to save it as the default, which will mean that every time new charts are opened, they'll automatically have that scheme that you've set up. So once you do this, you then put in the name, click save, and it'll save that chart template for you. And then as I said, it'll be in this section here with your chart templates. You can also edit templates as well if you need to in the future. Now let's take a look at some of the things you might want to add to your chart for your technical analysis. These are usually in two categories. It's either objects that you're going to draw onto the chart or indicators that you're going to add to the chart. And both of these are in the charts tab over here. So for objects, we go to graphic elements and you can see there's plenty of options here. Also, if you come into these sections here, they'll extend outwards and you'll find more things that you can add to your chart. So let's say I want to start by adding a swing high. So I've chosen horizontal line I'm going to anchor it up at the top here. And now if I want to change it, I can right click, go to edit. And let's say I want to change the width. I could do that, make it a bit thicker. And maybe I want to change the color to make it green. So I click OK, click apply, and that's changed there. Now I can move it around if I want to, move it up to here, for example. And then if I'm done with it, I can right click. You can also duplicate it if you want, or I can go to delete. Let's say that I want to add a trend line. You'll see here there's the option for trend line, but I actually prefer to use the ray because then it's going to extend out to the right, so I'll be able to see if the price interacts with it in future. So I come to ray, I click down here for the starting point, and then let's say I want to click up here for the second anchor point, and again I can right click and edit, and for this one since I've got two touching points, maybe I want to say that this one's unconfirmed at the moment, so I can change the style to a dotted line or a dashed line so that I know that that level is unconfirmed. Then in terms of indicators, that's up here, the list of indicators. Again, there are plenty of options available to you. Or if there's a custom indicator you've been using on a different platform, you can also choose to install the new indicator into this platform as well. So if I go to trend and let's say that, for example, I'm adding a moving average so I click that, I can change any of the settings if I want to. 
choose which time frames I wanted to appear on. So we're currently on the four hour time frame, so it's set to just appear on this time frame. Uh, maybe I also want it on the one hour and the 15 minute, and I click apply. It's to take a moment to load, and there we go. So now if I change time frames, I'll also see it on the other time frames I chose. For example, the 15 minute, the one hour, and of course the four hour, which is the initial one that we were on. As well as being able to add objects to our chart through the graphic elements button that's in the charts tab, we can also come over to the windows tab here and we'll find a detachable graphic panel. Now this is really useful because if you're using a lot of objects for your analysis, you can then just have this to the side. I click this button up here to make it vertical rather than horizontal. And then it's just easy access whenever you need to use one of your objects. So the first thing you're going to want to do is to actually start a new project. So over here in the home tab, we have new project. If I click that, I can now give it a name. Let's go for example three. I can change the deposit amount. That's not going to matter too much, but it can be useful when you're creating certain scenarios, which is what we'll do a bit later. We'll leave it as it is for now. We go to next. We choose the markets that we want to have within this project. So I'm just going to choose Euro dollar. It's going to be about 10 years of data. I want to use lower time frames and higher time frames, so I'm going to use one minute and tick data. You can also come to your advanced settings and change things here if you want to. I'm going to keep it exactly as it is though. For example, in particular, you might want to change the, the spread, use floating spread or not. And we go to next, and it's just going to check the available history. Now, the first time that you do all of this, it will take a little bit longer than usual, but once you've had a few projects, you've downloaded data before, it'll be relatively quick. Then I can choose my start time or start date. So for example, if I want to start from the beginning of the data, that would be 2003. But if I want to start where there's already some data on the charts, maybe I want to change this. And in this case, I'm going to change it to 2022 and just the first. And I've clicked enter there, but you can change the, the um, time zone that you're in and various other things there. This can take a little while to load. So we'll just leave it to load and come back when it's already loaded. Okay, so once the data is loaded, you can see that it's already started moving for us. So we can just hit the pause button over here. And whenever you're done with your simulated session, you can come over here. And if it's the first time that you're saving it, you click this arrow, go to save project as, and then enter a name for it. And then in future, once this has been saved once, you can just click this button here to save it. And of course, if you want to open your projects, you can click this one to open previous projects as well. Let's take a look at the basic functions for controlling the time in the simulator. So as I said before, sometimes you want to speed things up, sometimes slow things down, sometimes pause or jump to another period in time. And all of that is done up here. So as you can see at the moment, the, the charts are paused and we can see this big button saying resume. So if I click that, you can also see that it's turned into a pause button now. So if I want to pause the charts, I just click that. So we'll let it sort of play. And you can see this is a five minute chart we're looking at and it's going quite quickly for a five minute chart. So perhaps I want it to be more like real time. I can slow it down like this. And now we can see the individual movements that are happening within that candle rather than only looking at completed candles. Or it might be that I want to get ahead quickly to the next opportunity, in which case I can just drag this along and speed it up. So let's put it back to a slower setting. Now, if we pause the chart again, we can see we have bar back and bar forward. So that's literally moving one bar at a time. So if I click this a few times, you can see how the bars are moving one at a time forwards. And if it's that I've missed something and I wanna go back, I can just click to go back as well. I can also come over here to where it says tick. And if I click this arrow here, I can change it. So each tick is a different period of time. At the moment it's set to auto. Maybe I want it to be one day. So now what I can do is if I click this button, it will jump ahead an entire day. I can still go one bar forward, one bar back, but if I want to jump ahead a day, I can click that. Then if I want to go to a particular period of time, perhaps to check on a trade that I've already had in the past, or to trade a particular scenario or a particular market type, I can go to jump to, and either I can find the period on the chart. So for example, if I wanted to go to the start of the year, then I've clicked search, and it's just show me that period of time. Or if I actually want to go to that period, I could do the same thing here. And now, instead of just finding that point on the chart, it's actually put me all the way back there so I can trade from that point onwards. 
Now you might want to use this for the different scenarios and the different historical scenarios that you'll, you'll want to trade as part of your practice sessions. One option is to do this, what I've just shown you, and another option is to actually start a simulated session from a different point in time by starting a new project. It might be the case that for your analysis, you need to use multiple timeframes. So in that case, in the home tab, we can come up here to time frame, and you can see at the moment we're on the five minute chart. So we can switch that to one hour, daily, four hour, or we can come over here to edit time frame and add or remove time frames. So if there's one that's not in the list that you want, for example, three minutes, you can just add that one in yourself. Alternatively, we can come over here to the charts tab and you can see there's a button for new chart. There's also range bar and Renko bar if you want to use those. If it comes to new chart, we can see in the list is Euro dollar because that's the only market that I added to this project. So I can click that and it does take a, a little while to load sometimes. But once that's loaded, you can see I've now got two charts down here in the different tabs. So I can switch between these back to the four hour. This one I could maybe set to the daily chart and we'll remove the news by right clicking and going to show news, deselect that. So I can switch between those if I want to use multiple timeframes or alternatively, if I come up here to windows, I can tile them vertically like this so I can see them side by side. Now, if you added more markets to your project, remember we, we only added Euro dollar to this one. If you have more markets, you can go to charts and choose one of the other markets as well. That's what's really great about this simulator compared to others that I've used, particularly some of the more popular ones that are out there. You can only trade one market at a time. With Forex Tester, you can actually have multiple different markets. So it's more realistic with how you'd be trading in real life because in real life, you're not restricted to just, to just following one market. If you want to follow more, you can follow more. And that's what you can do here as well. So now that we've been through some of the tools and features, let's discuss how to start executing and managing your trades. Okay, now I'm going to show you some of the most critical things you need to know how to do as a trader, which is obviously opening trades, modifying the positions you already have open, and setting pending orders, and all of the different functions around that. So here on screen, we have a very basic situation. The price is failing at a short-term trend line, and I'm going to keep things really simple. Let's say that this is a simple strategy I'm following. I'm not saying I would trade this way, but I'm choosing a way of trading here that everyone will be able to understand for this example. So the price is failing at the trend line, and let's say that I'm targeting this horizontal level down here where we've had the two lows. And essentially what I want to do is open the trade short, as soon as it moves into a significant amount of profit, I want to move my stop loss to break even. And as we get to this horizontal level, I want to scale out 50% of the position, set the stop loss to this area down here and let the rest of the position run. Okay, so straightforward. The first thing I want to do is open a market order. So you can see you've got a market order and a pending order. The market order is going to open the trade straight away. The pending order is a an order that I can set at a particular price point. So if the price hits that level, it will enter the trade. I can also come over here to the orders tab and see the same buttons here. So we're going to click market order. I'm obviously looking to go short with this position. And let's say that I want to risk 1.2% of my account. Now, one way that I can do this is to enter the number of lots over here. If you had more markets, you may be able to choose the different markets that you want to trade in, but obviously, in this project, we only have Euro dollar open. So I'm going to go for this checkbox here, calculate with risk percent. And you can see I've got 1.2% at risk. And you'll see that for this, the stop loss is required. This is essentially helping you to do dynamic position sizing, where you choose the percentage at risk, choose where your stop loss is going to be positioned, and it will calculate the number of lots for you. So you need to choose what direction you're going in. In this case, we're selling. So over here at the stop loss, I could enter the price where the stop loss is going to be, or the number of pips or I can click this button here and actually select it on the chart. So let's say I want to allow the price to be able to test this, um, the wick of this candle here, and I'm just gonna put it above there. So you can see now it's calculated based on 1.2% at risk with this stop loss that we're gonna have 84.64 lots. So I can now, if I wanted to add to take profit, but I'm going to just leave it as it is and click sell. So you can see we're now in the position. Now, when we have a trade open, if we come over here to windows, we can go to open positions and you'll see that there's a pending order button here next to it, but we're just gonna stick with the open positions for now. I click that, it opens this little window. I prefer to drag this down. And if I put it to the bottom of the screen, you'll see it highlights the area where it will be. If I let go, 
it's now at the bottom, just like how it would be in MetaTrader or things like that. Okay, so I can see my trade open there. So let's go back to the home screen and just move along. Okay, great, the price has moved down, so I'm in profit on the trade. And now I'd say this is significant enough that I want to move my stop loss. So there are two ways that I can do this. The first way would be if I double click on the trade here in the window and then edit a stop loss, exactly the same as before, I can either change the price or click this button and move it manually. But there's also another little cool feature if I go to orders, which is I can click here to move my stop loss to break even. Okay, so that's more straightforward. So that's done. So let's keep going ahead and we can see price still moving down. We can see my position in profit down here at the bottom. And remember, as the price hits that swing low, like this, now I said I wanted to move my stop loss and scale out part of the position. So if we go back to the orders over here, in fact, we'll, we'll go to the button up here to modify the order and we'll move the stop loss and we're going to put it here so we can test this level again from the other side. And let's click modify order. Then if I right click on this trade and choose close part of position, I can now choose how many lots I want to exit. So I want to do about half. We're going to just put in 42, close. So you can see now that on screen it shows where I've opened the trade and closed the trade. It can get quite messy if you're opening a lot of trades. So you can right click on the chart, go to show account history, deselect that and it will not be there anymore. Okay, so what we're going to do is just allow the, the price to continue. And let's say it reaches this point and I want to close the trade. So I can simply right click here and close the position. Done. And if I show you the account history again, you can see it here. Now, once I've closed my trades, I can now come over here to the Windows tab, click on account history, and I can see the trades that I've opened here. Also, something that's very important for these simulation sessions, since you're using these to either practice or to collect data and optimize, you can also come over here to statistics and see a whole bunch of statistics for the trades that you've taken during that session. I could also drag this and have it just to the side of my charts if I wanted to be able to keep track of that the whole time. So you could have your charts set up like this where you can see your statistics over here, your open positions down here, and then obviously be trading inside the chart itself here. And then finally, we have the pending orders. So for this one, it's set up in a very similar way to the market order, except this time I'm choosing the price. Now in uh, like a real broker for like live trading, you might have lots of different types of orders here, they've kept it simple. We have a buy limit, sell limit, buy stop, sell stop, because a lot of the other order types wouldn't make sense to use in a simulator anyway, uh, because you'd need real market participants. But that's more than enough to be practicing with using pending orders as well. So let's say, for example, I want to have a, an order up here, um, and that's going to be a sell limit, for example. I'll click cancel. So that's all you need to know, really, for managing your trades. You don't need to keep things sort of that complicated or anything like that. But you can see in the orders tab, we've got a number of things that could be quite helpful, like opening a group of orders, closing all positions and orders. So if you wanted to go back to neutral with various trades that you have open, you could do that. You can change your balance. So you can deposit money here as well. So it's just like in real life. Let's say that you have uh, a way of trading or the, the way that you have your money management is that you're depositing money every month. You might want to replicate that in a simulator so that it's like real life for you. So there's all kinds of things that you can do here. So now you're all set up and ready to get started. Remember towards the beginning of the video, I briefly mentioned some of the advantages of using a trading simulator. But now I want to go back through some of those in a lot more detail, explaining how specific features of the simulator, like some of those we've just been through, will benefit you in a particular way. Then we'll move on to discuss the drawbacks as well, so you know what you won't be able to replace from the live markets. So the first huge benefit of a trading simulator is that you can slow down or speed up time or rewind if you want to replay something again. This makes it perfect for going through purposeful or deliberate practice sessions, which is the fastest and best way to develop a skill to a world-class level. And it's something that we'll discuss a little bit later on, what it involves and so on. 
Now, most literature on deliberate practice says that when you hit a plateau in your development, you need to find creative ways to overcome it. Sometimes this involves slowing the skill down to give yourself more time to think it through and to sort of deconstruct the steps. Sometimes it means speeding things up. But in the live markets, we can only go at one speed, normal, real life, linear time. That limits the way that we can develop. Remember in the introduction, I mentioned that if we create unrealistic restrictions when we're training, it will make the real thing much easier to deal with. So speeding up time is one way to create those sorts of restrictions. If you run your simulator at a faster speed than normal, it gives you less time to make your decisions. In the live markets, when your emotions are running high and you're feeling under pressure, then time can feel like it's going really quickly. It can feel like you don't have much time to choose what to do. Should I enter? Should I exit? Should I scale out, scale in? Is that a threat? Is that an opportunity? So we can prepare ourselves for this by giving ourselves less time to think in the simulator. So it won't create that sense of urgency in the same way as you experience it in the live markets, but it can create it in a different way. This helps you to begin adapting more and more to intense situations without risking real money or developing unhelpful conditioned responses. The second benefit of being able to speed up time in the simulator is that you can pretty much fast forward to the next opportunity, so it's much quicker. You know, one of the problems of developing in the live markets is that most of your time is actually wasted waiting for things to happen. But when you have that buzz of learning something new, you want to be taking action. So inevitably what people do is they do take actions, but they take actions they shouldn't be taking just because they're wanting to satisfy their enthusiasm or cure their boredom. Likewise, an important part of developing a skill is going through repetitions. Think about what you do to build muscles in the gym. You overload your muscles with the heavier weights, you're challenging yourself more than last time, and you lift that weight. But do you lift it once? No, you repeat it. You have sets of reps that you have to complete, so it's repetitions and repetitions. And the same is true for our trading. You learn skills through repetition. And being able to fast forward time means that you can do that in a much shorter period than if you did it in the live markets. On the other hand, sometimes you need to slow things down to deconstruct a skill and give yourself enough time to think things through for every single individual step. Just like if you're learning a tennis serve for the first time, you'll break it down to the component parts and learn each of those properly individually before you then string them all back together and complete a whole serve. So you can slow down time in the simulator. This allows you to consider all aspects of a situation and learn to make the right decisions, learn to process all of that information before you then gradually speed it up and speed it up so you adapt to processing all that information at a quicker pace and a quicker pace. Whereas if you did this in the live markets, the way that you'd adapt to a quicker pace of having to make these decisions and process this information is to cut corners, take shortcuts, or just reduce the amount of information you process, or use the higher timeframes that are at a slower pace, but that might not be appropriate for your approach to trading. So the simulator gives you a much more practical and suitable option. And speaking of speed, if you want to accelerate your development and fit in more repetitions that will help you learn the skills, the simulator can also help you with this because it allows you to trade during the weekends. If you work during the week, the weekends might be your best time to learn. Now, if you're using the live markets, your options are either use cryptocurrencies or other markets that are open, but the activity isn't the same at the weekend as it is during the week, or scroll back on old charts and practice with those instead, which is a static approach. You see, when you do that, you can see how the candles closed, but not necessarily how the price moved during that time. Sometimes the speed of the price movements within each candle is also important and you'll develop implicit knowledge. You'll learn through seeing those actions taking place. So when you identify them in the live markets, you'll have some pattern recognition in your mind. This also relates to the next benefit, which is that the simulator is not a static approach. It functions like a live trading account. You can open and close trades, compound your account, watch price moves as if they're in real time rather than just looking at completed candles. And by doing it this way, opening and closing trades as if it's a real account, it also means you're collecting data which you can then analyze to help you optimize your approach, to test new things or find areas of weakness. You know, it's just like I said before, there's a big problem that traders who are just learning using a demo account face. At some point, they're going to feel like they're ready to move on to a live account with real money, just a feeling they've got. But the problem is because they've been learning using the real markets and that's where they've been opening their trades, they just don't have a big enough sample size from the real markets 
to know whether they are truly consistently profitable or not. So if they jump into a live account, they're just going to lose money. Whereas if you collect data on a simulator, this can back up the trading that you've been doing in the real markets to give you more clarity about the stage you're really at with your trading. You can see if you genuinely are consistently profitable across a bigger sample size. And finally, one of the most important things for becoming a complete trader who can handle any situation in the markets is to experience as many different types of market activity as you can. Most traders will develop this progressively over many, many years by trading through different market events, different cycles and so on. But if you have a simulator, you can just create a list of all the different sorts of events you want to experience and then go back in time and trade them. Want to know what it's like trading the financial crisis? No problem, go back to 2007, 2008 and start trading. So as you can see, using a simulator rather than just a live account or a demo account helps you fit in a huge amount of learning and experience into a relatively short space of time. Unfortunately though, if you're hearing all of this and thinking it sounds too good to be true, well, there are some downsides as well. So let's go through some of those. The first issue is obviously about how real it actually is. Sure, the mechanics of it might be the same, but the psychology plays an important part in trading. We can try to increase the jeopardy in the simulator in some way and create restrictions that cause more stress and pressure, but it's not going to exactly replicate having real money on the line and how you cope with that risk. So with that in mind, you can't go straight from trading in a simulator to trading in the live markets with real money and think it's going to be exactly the same. You'd still need to ease yourself in and adapt to real trading as well. Remember earlier I said the phases should be knowledge acquisition, skill drilling, simulated performance, and then real-time performance. So the first phase, knowledge acquisition, will come from studying information, whether that's reading books, watching a course, watching videos on YouTube, and if you're in that stage, check out the link in the description box below to start learning for free with us. Then the second phase, skill drilling, is best done on a simulator. As I said before, this is all about getting repetitions and repetitions of a particular skill or technique. Maybe it's breaking down the structure, mapping some sort of significant levels, identifying price action. You can drill these things in the simulator many more times than you could in the live markets. Then we have simulated performance. Well, that one's in the name, isn't it? Simulated. So you can practice trading across a whole range of different market situations and get yourself to the point where you have consistently profitable performance over a big enough sample size to know that you're ready for the live markets. Then comes phase four, real-time performance. If you know you have consistently profitable performance over a large sample size in the simulator, you'll know that you're ready for this. But the main obstacle then is how risking real money will affect your decision-making process. Therefore, you can transition by starting off with just small amounts at risk, so small that it doesn't affect you emotionally. Then when you're used to that, you increase it a bit more and so on and so on. This is known as graded exposure and it allows you to continue to adapt to new levels of risk without it disrupting your usual decision-making process. The next drawback of using a simulator is something that can actually become a big problem. Since we can fast forward with the simulator, you can get a bit too used to being able to take actions all of the time and not have to develop the patience that's needed to wait in the real markets for the right opportunity to come up. So as a result, when you do transition to the live markets, your boredom might end up being a trigger for taking the wrong actions. You might not even realize it's happening. You spend so much time scrutinizing every single move in the market to an inappropriate degree that you end up convincing yourself that you need to do something. Likewise, when you have a trade open, you end up micromanaging it and doing things just to be able to do something. Closing trades too early, scaling in or out, moving your stop loss, revenge trading, and so on. However, the way to overcome that is actually quite simple. If you know you're ready for phase four, start transitioning yourself slowly towards that in the simulator so that you're ready. Slowly start to reduce the speed of the simulator over the course of a number of weeks or start to limit how much you're allowed to fast forward during your trading session until you get more and more used to having to spend time waiting and being patient. Yes, it takes time. Yes, it takes discipline, but it's worth it because it stops you from being a losing trader. So it pays off in terms of real money in the long run. So it's worth doing. So you can see on screen here that I've put a little guide that you can follow for following each of these phases and preparing to transition into the next one. Feel free to take note of these or take a screenshot to help you when you're creating a proper development plan.
Now, it can also be the case that if you're collecting data on your performance or your trading system using the simulator, it's too easy to just rush through your analysis and end up opening trades that you wouldn't normally if you'd spent more time thinking it through. This can also lead to bad habits in your analysis process being developed as you go through too quickly rather than being more meticulous about it as you would in the real markets. You tend to see this in people's trade journals in particular. If they're trading a demo or a live account, they'll keep these detailed explanations for each of their trades, which then gives them a chance for more learning or optimization. But most traders don't treat simulated trades with the same level of commitment. They don't give a detailed write-up of why they took certain trades. And actually on that note, in a separate video, I'm going to give you a detailed breakdown in a long guide like this one about how to track your data in the right way that will end up leading you to finding areas of optimization and things that you need to improve. When it's released, we'll have it linked up here. The next downside is that your development will be more heavily weighted towards explicit learning and you'll lose a lot of the opportunities for implicit learning that are really important for good trading and that you would normally develop in the live markets. This is something we'll discuss in more detail in another video because it's something a lot of traders get wrong and when that's released that will also be linked up here. But what this means is that it's important that you still follow the live markets at certain points throughout the week even if you are using a simulator. And finally the last negative aspect is that it costs money. I haven't seen any simulators that are free, at least not good ones, and for some people the price tag may seem on the expensive side. But honestly, as an investment into your development as a trader, it really is a no-brainer. And from that point of view, I think it's great value for money. The alternative for most traders is losing real money in the live markets anyway. So a simulator might actually be a cost-saving measure for some people. And likewise, there's an opportunity cost with the time that you spend learning when you do it in the live markets. So since a simulator will speed up your learning process, it means you're saving overall. So it's still a good decision despite the price tag. So because of some of these drawbacks of using a simulator, it means that you'll still have to learn to a certain extent using the live markets as well. So the simulator is not intended to completely replace that. But instead, if you use it alongside live trading, whether that's on a demo account or real money, you'll be able to develop at a much more accelerated pace. You can use the powers of both the simulator and the live markets to help you become a high performance trader much, much quicker. So what you should do is just create a schedule that divides your week in a way that allows for time on both the simulator and in the live markets. Even if you don't want to follow the phases that I outlined a moment ago, those four phases, you can still use a hybrid approach with the simulator and the live markets. You could trade the live markets during the week and then use the simulator at the weekend to fill in any gaps that the live markets aren't providing for you, like going back to historical situations and things like that. This is an awesome approach and will have a massive compounding effect on your skill development. Okay, we can think of this as being part two of the video. I'm now going to explain a number of different practices and processes that you can do using a simulator to dramatically improve your trading performance. In a separate video, I'll break down in detail how to structure your practice sessions so you're performing purposeful or deliberate practice rather than ordinary practice. And you can also check out this video up here that explains it a bit. But for now, I'll just give you a high level overview because it's important for understanding how to use a simulator to level up your skill set. There are three types of practice you can go through. Ordinary, purposeful and deliberate practice. Ordinary practice is what most traders do. They'll sit at their charts and just trade. They'll progress a bit, but beyond a certain point, you're just going to reach a plateau because the practice isn't directed appropriately. I always like to explain this with the example of driving. So when you're learning to drive, you're going through driving lessons and so on, then you develop quite quickly because you're focusing on developing specific skills. Then once you pass your test, you might gain more experience on the roads, but even after 10 or 20 years of driving most days of the week, you're not going to be at a Lewis Hamilton level of skill. You'll likely have more or less the same level of skill as you did all those years before, just after you passed your test. It's because when you're driving each day, you're just going through ordinary practice. It's within your comfort zone. On the other hand, purposeful practice is much more specific and focused. It involves breaking down skills and setting specific objectives for each practice session, choosing a particular thing to focus on and knowing what you need to achieve with it. You aim to constantly be pushing yourself into what we call the skill challenge sweet spot. 
not too close to your current ability level that is within your comfort zone or you won't improve, and not too far out of your comfort zone that is too difficult for you to achieve. It's all about being difficult enough to challenge yourself, but still being attainable. On the other hand, ordinary practice is mostly within your comfort zone and that's where most traders stay. So to keep that level of challenge going so that you're constantly pushing yourself, constantly challenging yourself, sometimes it will be about learning a more advanced technique and other times it will be about setting restrictions and parameters that make things more difficult for you so that you're forced to adapt. Then the next level up from purposeful practice is deliberate practice. This one usually requires a coach or mentor who has achieved the success that you're aiming for or at least knows how to create a path towards it. They can provide you with instant feedback on what you're doing well or what you're doing wrong and figure out ways to alter your practice sessions to help you overcome sticking points. Now, as I said, this is the high level view and there is a lot more to it than what we've just gone through. But at least from these brief explanations, you can already see how a practice session should be designed if you want to be able to improve. It's not ordinary practice. It's not this magical screen time that all traders talk about. That would be keeping you in your comfort zone. Instead, we can actually think about it in terms of the following elements. There's breaking a skill down to its main chunks, focusing your practice sessions on specific goals for those chunks, pushing yourself outside your comfort zone into that skill challenge sweet spot, getting feedback and going through repetitions. You'll need to have gone through the knowledge acquisition stage, that's phase one, to be able to break a skill down to its main chunks or have a mentor to do it for you. And you'll need an expert to give you feedback if you want to engage in deliberate practice. But for all those other elements that I just explained to you, these are things that you can do in a simulator that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do as easily without one. So let's take a look at a very basic example involving risk management. So with these purposeful practice sessions, it's all about finding a specific area of your trading to focus on for that session and having a clear goal of what you want to achieve. Now, a good way of thinking about this is that you can have in your, your mind an idea of where your trading needs to be, like what it looks like to execute the skill perfectly or at least to a more optimal level and define what that means. And then gauge where your current ability level is and between the ideal situation and your current ability level, there'll be a gap. And the purposeful practice sessions should be designed to help you bridge that gap. So for example, if here we're focusing on moving the stop loss once we're in profit, so first moving it to break even and then continuing to move it into profit, I could say that an ideal situation would mean that I'm able to move the stop loss without unnecessarily getting my stop loss triggered and then the price ends up moving in my favor and I missed out on all that profit and not moving it too little that I end up losing more money than I need to, like or more of my profit unnecessarily. So I can tell, okay, that's the ideal situation. So in that case, what is the way that I can practice from where I am to that point? Like maybe I gauge that right now, okay, I'm getting stopped out a lot. When I move my stop loss, I'm maybe coming in too early with moving the stop loss. I need to get better at doing that. So what practice can I do that's going to bridge that gap? Well, I can go back over all of my old entries and take that approach of moving my stop loss. That'll be maybe a first step. Then I can do it where I find new entries and so on and so on. So let's say I'm doing it with my old entries. I can go back through my trade journal, group together all of the trades from one particular market, in this case, Euro dollar, and starting with the oldest one, I can just look at what the entry criteria was, like what did I have mapped on the chart at the entry and where did I enter and take that entry and try not to look at the trade management part of it and try not to look at what happened with the price after that point of entry. Now, of course, if you can remember all of your trades, if you don't take that many of them and it's easy for you to remember what happened in the market after you entered the trade, then you're better off finding new trades. But I can take this trade. Uh, let's let's actually do that. So if we go to market order and this time it doesn't matter about what the position size is, what the percentage at risk is, because the focus of this session is on moving the stop loss. So it's not about any other factor, Is that's the focus. Which means if you're finding new entries rather than going over old ones, then also the focus is on the moving of the stop loss. That's what you're focusing on the session. So if you get the entry wrong, then that's okay. Like obviously it's not ideal, but that's okay because that's not the focus of the session. You want to make sure you're not focusing on too many things at once, just focus on the important thing. You could even just find random points on the chart, enter a trade long or short and assume, okay, if that was an entry, then what facts can I pick up on here to show me at what point I should start moving my stop loss? 
that could be a way to do it. You can think of all kinds of other restrictions. So let's um, add the initial stop loss. We'll give it some space to sort of fluctuate around this double confirmation here. And we'll click buy. Now, either we could click resume and have the price move along uh, in real time or at a different speed, or we can move along one bar at a time. Now, if you move along one bar at a time, you're having more time to think. So you're adding sort of less things that you need to adapt to. So you could start off by moving one bar at a time. So here, okay, you've moved into profit. And eventually, as you get better, you can then make it real time speed so that you're doing it in the same way that you would in the live markets. And then you could increase the speed. That makes it more difficult that you've got to make decisions much quicker and act much quicker. So you can do things that starts to force yourself to make the adaptations and force yourself to overcome these obstacles that helps you grow, that then bridges the gap between your current ability level and where you're trying to get to. And this is quite a straightforward example, but it could apply to anything, mapping or sort of identifying the structure in the markets, picking up on price action, uh, identifying when there's increase in volume, whatever it might be. So let's uh, continue moving along. And let's say, okay, at this point, I'm going to choose to adjust my stop loss. I'm going to go to open positions, drag this down to the bottom, just so that it's there the whole time. And I'm going to move my stop loss. So let's say I, I want it to be that if it breaks the trend line, then I'm out of it. Okay, so let's say I want to now adjust it again. And this time I'm going to have it blow here. And you can also set for your, your session like how you would exit the trade. So for this one, it might be that I want to exit with the stop loss being hit rather than um, choosing the right exit point. So I'm not going to be picking where I think the price is going to now reverse against me or when the probabilities have increased of that happening. Instead, I'm just going to keep moving the stop loss and wait till that's hit and see uh, what, like how that compares to whatever gauge of success I would have picked for the practice session. So again, we're going to move the stop loss up to here and continue. Okay, so at this point, I can see we've hit a path of resistance at the top there. Um, so I'm going to just adjust the stop loss up again to, let's say, here. What we'll do is just click the resume button and speed it up so we can get through this quicker. Okay, so it didn't hit the stop loss, so so far I can say, okay, that was quite a good move there. And we can now adjust this one up to here. We're hitting another path of resistance here, so at this point I might think there's a better chance of the market moving heavily against me, so I might want to put my stop loss quite a bit tighter at this point. Uh, so let's do that. Again, this isn't a lesson in how to move your stop loss, so don't take everything I'm saying here as gospel. Uh, the, the point of this lesson is how to do the purposeful practice session. Okay, so it's now broken through. So maybe adjust this up. That if it breaks back below, then I get out of it. And there we go. So now I can sort of take note of where I exited the stop loss, sorry, exited the trade with the stop loss, uh, take note of the good points, like where I moved it and it was appropriate, and now see what the price does next to see whether I got out unnecessarily there. We can see so far, okay, I stopped myself getting this bit of loss here, but if I would kept my stop loss here, for example, would I have ended up with more profit? Was it worth the amount that I had at risk there? And we can see so far it's looking like it was a decent exit looking at the holding time as well i'd say for the situation that was probably appropriate so that's just an example with moving the stop loss now there are plenty of things you could do with your deliberate practice or your purposeful practice but it's all about making sure that you're creating the restrictions that force you to be improving in the specific area you want to improve understanding what a successful outcome for the session would be, 
understanding how you're marking yourself, like how you're going to give yourself feedback about whether you were successful the, se the session or not. And all of this is about understanding the skill you're trying to build deeply. So you have to make sure you've gone through the knowledge acquisition stage properly to be able to do that. What type of skills you practice and how you break down those skills will depend on the method of trading that you're using. So I can't guide you with that. But if you want to learn how I trade, check the link in the description box to our development program. You can get started for free. And I've basically broken down everything I know about trading in that program in chunks that make it more straightforward to learn and practice in these sorts of sessions. As I mentioned before, you can also create unrealistic restrictions and parameters that force you to trade in a more uncomfortable situation. This forces you to adapt and to learn how to deal with challenges that you might face. Now, part of this involves creating scenarios. You can think of this sort of like when you practice different set plays or situations when you're in training on a sports team. Like for example, a football team playing 10 against 11. So you're more suited to when a player gets a red card and how to deal with those situations. In particular, this can be really useful if you're planning on gaining funding from a prop trading firm. You know that there are certain criteria that you need to pass to be able to achieve that funding. So you can think of all the worst case scenarios you might encounter during that process and then trade in those scenarios in the simulator until you eventually become more comfortable with them. Then you'll be prepared for whatever happens during that funding process. Let me show you an example. Let's say that I'm about to do one of the prop firm challenges to try and get funded. And I want to go through all of the worst case scenarios so I can be prepared for it. Well, in this case, it might be that I have a maximum drawdown limit of 10%. Okay, so if I hit 10%, then I lose the account or I lose the challenge and I need to achieve a 10% return. Or it might be that you're in a second phase and you need to achieve a 5% return. So what can I do? I can start a project where we'll call this prop trading and whatever deposit is that you'll have, let's say that the deposit is going to be 100,000. So that's how much capital I've got to trade with with this, um, this challenge. But let's say I want to create a scenario where I'm two weeks into the challenge and I'm in a 7% drawdown, okay? So we can change this now to 93,000. So I'm now setting a challenge for myself where I need to get myself back to the $100,000 before the end of the time limit. So let's say I'm going to give myself two weeks to achieve it. So in the simulator, I, once two weeks has passed, I end the simulator. And if I get to 100,000 in that time, then I can do a reattempt, or I've succeeded in achieving this scenario or you know, had a successful outcome. Or even better, if I start to get above that break even with enough time left, I can start to aim towards that 10% return that I need to actually pass the challenge. So really straightforward, you can create these sorts of scenarios for yourself. It might be, for example, that rather than being in drawdown, maybe I am at 107,000, and I need to get to 110,000 to pass, but I've only got one week left to achieve it in. So I give myself one week in a simulator and I go through that. And if you go through these time and time again, and as you start to be able to successfully complete one type of scenario, you make it more difficult. So for example, if it was 7% drawdown, okay, now I've got 8% drawdown, now 9% drawdown, or maybe I'm only 4% in drawdown, but I've only got two days left. As you go through these, make them more and more difficult, you're preparing yourself more and more for going through that challenge with your real trading. Because when you're going through the challenge, you're going to have this extra psychological pressure, things that you need to deal with in the real markets that you don't have to deal with when you're practicing or thinking about how you're going to deal with these challenges. So the more you give yourself pressure and struggles in your training, then when you come up to those challenges, it'll be much much more of a smooth process for you. Even if you don't encounter these sorts of scenarios with your prop trading, at least you know you're prepared. Being a professional with your trading, being a professional with anything, is about being prepared for anything and being prepared fully. So this is going to help you to get more prepared for that. So on your screen now, you can see a list of other examples of different scenarios that you might want to consider, but really the list could be endless. You might even want to take note of difficult situations you encounter with your real trading, and then go back on the simulator, find similar situations and practice it over and over again until you become more comfortable with it. But then once you have those core skills, it's time to develop your trading system, which will dictate how you apply those skills in a consistent way. A lot of people use the terms system and strategy interchangeably, as if they just mean the same thing. But at Duomo, we look at it a bit differently. 
Your system is the set of fixed steps that you follow each and every time in any market that ensures that you approach your analysis and decision making in a consistent way. After all, if you want to be a consistently profitable trader, you have to be consistent. So the system is what helps you ensure that that's the case. On the other hand, your strategies are how you approach each step in the system. For example, once you reach a step in your system that's about executing a trade, your strategy will vary depending on the context of that situation. That might include whether it's a ranging market or a trending, how big the price moves are, how volatile the market is, any significant levels you have, and so on. Likewise, when you're analyzing a market, the system might dictate that you analyze the structure first, and then the following steps after that might differ depending on whether it's a range, trending, and so on. Whereas your strategy for that analysis will depend on the context of that structure. It's more specific to that situation. Now, this is a topic for another time. This video is meant to be all about the simulator, but it was important that I explain how I define the difference between systems and strategies for what we're about to discuss now. So most of your work on creating your system will be done just based on your planning, like whether it's on the computer or on paper, it doesn't really matter. You're going to come up with the steps that you're going to follow and why you're going to follow those steps. The simulator then comes into the picture as a way to run through the system, to find potential flaws, things that work well, or things that need to be adjusted in some way. And the reason the simulator is great for this rather than the live markets is because firstly, you can start with as many fresh charts as you need to. In the live markets, you can switch between different markets if you want a fresh chart to look at that hasn't got any analysis on it. But once a market has been analyzed, it's done for now. Whereas with a simulator, you can go backwards or forwards in time to find new situations to run your system through. So it's an endless supply. So you can keep testing your system in new scenarios and see how it works. And that relates to the other great thing about using a simulator for this process, which is that you can very quickly test your system in a variety of different market contexts. Maybe you want to start with a ranging market, then see if the system holds up as well in a trending market, then a market with more compression or consolidation, a market with high volatility during the summer period, during the festive period, and so on. You get the idea. So this allows you to very quickly see whether there are steps that you've missed or ones that might be inappropriate for certain types of markets. And this avoids you wasting time following the system in the live markets for weeks on end only to then hit a roadblock when you encounter a market situation that causes you to have to go back to the drawing board. So you can go through all of this much quicker. Then once you have a system that you think works and applies to all relevant situations that you might trade in, you can drill the system over and over again, practice it. It's just like I said at the start of the video, the more we do something consistently, the more automatic it becomes for us. So we don't have to consciously think about it each and every time. You know, most people who say they have a system but then struggle to stick with it, they'll blame it on a lack of discipline. That's part of the reason why you always hear about traders needing to be so disciplined. But the truth is, it's not a matter of discipline in most cases. The problem is that they have the system written down and they know the steps involved in it if you ask them what they are, but it's not something that they're unconsciously competent with. Therefore, when they're in a high pressure situation and they need to make a decision, they don't know the plan well enough to fall back on. So they default to instincts and conditioned responses instead. Just like learning different techniques and different skills, you have to go through repetitions of using your system over and over again, then checking back on the steps that you took to see whether you followed all the steps correctly and correcting any situations where you didn't. The simulator is great for this because of the wide variety of situations that you can trade in a really short amount of time, but also because you can start off by keeping things really slow and making sure you meticulously follow every step of your system and then gradually speed it up and speed it up as you go through more repetitions and start getting more comfortable with following the system consistently. Then we come on to your strategies and the processes that you follow for formulating these strategies. These are the aspects that will vary depending on the market context. So unlike your system, which is the set of fixed steps that helps keep you consistent and to make sure you've processed all the information correctly, the strategies will be the variable parts. At the core of any good trading strategy is its expectancy. And more specifically, it should have a positive expectancy. Otherwise, what's the point? So expectancy, that's a combination of what's at risk, what the potential return is, and the probability of either of those outcomes happening. The result should be positive if you're trading that opportunity. So most traders will have the risk and return part sorted in their strategies. They know what's at risk, they know what potential profit they can make from it. But I see very few traders who understand how to estimate their probabilities. 
but without being able to estimate your probabilities, you have no idea whether the opportunity has a positive expectancy or not. You can't figure that out just from the risk reward alone. This is a big reason why most traders fail. They don't realize that they're actually trading negative expectancy situations. One of the key ways to improve your ability to estimate probabilities is to test and gather data. That takes a lot of time to do, but it's definitely worth the effort. However, it will take a hell of a lot longer to do in the live markets compared to when you use a simulator. Now, there are two mistakes that traders tend to make in this area. The first mistake is that they don't have a big enough sample size, so any statistics they have are inconclusive since it's the law of small numbers and there's going to be a lot of variability there. A trading simulator will solve this because just by spending one weekend testing, you could have a huge sample size and have a much better view of the success rates and probabilities of your trading approach. It would take you weeks, months, maybe even years to do that in the live markets. Just spending a weekend on it sounds like a pretty good deal to me. But then there's the second mistake. Some traders will put in the work and gather a decent sample size overall of their trading, but within that are different categories of situations that all have different contexts and influence the success rates in different ways. Therefore, when they actually break down that sample into the different categories, they might find that they have an inadequate number in certain situations that they've tested. And since each situation is going to have a different probability attached to it, they don't really have a good view of how their strategies perform. Again, a trading simulator can help with this because if you break down your trading into a range of possible situations, broadly speaking, you can then set out to test each of these one by one, spending a number of hours in the simulator testing each type of situation on its own and then logging the stats of how they performed. That's a much better way of doing it. So for example, it might be that I want to trade within a range and I have specific criteria for doing that. Great, now I'll go in the simulator, find situations that match that criteria, identifying a range, go through what my strategy would be, log the outcome and so on. Next, I might look at high momentum breakouts of some sort of significant level. Again, I go to the simulator, identify those situations. Next, I might move on to another one where I'm trading with the trend in steady state markets. Next, maybe it's reversals and so on. You get as specific as you need to for your system and you collect the data for that specific situation in just a matter of hours compared to over the course of months or years. And another great thing about the simulator is that you can just create a new save file for each of these tests and rather than manually logging the outcome, you could just trade it and let the simulator store it for you, the information from that trade. That way, it saves the information, you export it all to a spreadsheet from that particular testing session, and then you can easily just break down the data to find where you might need to change your approach. Now, for all these things that we've discussed, we have tried and tested approaches and processes that you can follow. They're all detailed for you extensively in our trader development program, the link is down below. So on screen here, you can see the broad steps that you need to follow, and now let's walk through an example. So an important part of being able to improve your trading is to collect data about your trades, both individually for each trade and as a whole, so that you have enough data to optimize, find areas of weakness, find things that you need to change or improve. And so there are two aspects. There's the qualitative aspect and the quantitative aspect. So the qualitative aspect comes in every time you execute a trade. So this is an example we go through in a section about trading different styles and approaches. So you'll see this example is just a basic one. I haven't added much analysis. But the first thing I want to do is have a full write up about this trade. So I want to take screenshots of the different time frames or any analysis that I had that contributes to this trade. There are two ways we can do this. We can either go to the charts tab within the platform and click screenshot and do it there. Or the way that I prefer, I find it much quicker, is to use the snipping tool in Windows. I'm sure there are alternatives in the Mac as well. And click new and just sort of take the section of the chart that I want to have a screenshot of. Then I use Notion for my qualitative journal. So over here in Notion, I will go into my trade journal and create a new version. But I'll open an example so you can see. And I have a template set up where I can then add my annotated screenshots and my explanation for each moment in the trade. Um, and therefore I know exactly what went on with that trade. Now this is important, firstly, so that you can go and review each trade and see what you did right or wrong. But also when you go through the optimization process where you have the quantitative data, sometimes you might raise questions through the data that can only be answered by looking back at each trade. So by having a full write-up, 
then you're going to have a, a much better chance of figuring out what was right, what was wrong, have the answers to your questions and so on. And also even the process of writing down what you did with the trade also makes you scrutinize your thought process and improve through implicit learning there as well. So let's go on to the data aspect. First of all, I would have done the full write-up, but let's say I've completed the trading session and I've got all of my trades. What I can do then is go to, in Windows, uh, over here, the Windows tab, we'll go to account history. Here we can see we, I've only opened one trade during a session, but assume there are, are many more there. I can right click, export the history to Excel. Then what you're going to have is this data here in an Excel file. And I'd recommend actually setting up your own spreadsheet. So I'm just going to pull up one that I've got for my trades. Well, this is actually an example, um, sim as an example spreadsheet with uh, just some sample data. And I can now copy and paste any of the relevant data from the spreadsheet that I exported from the simulator and then fill in other information myself, such as any information about the trade comments and stuff like that, uh, any tools that we used over here and so on. So that way you have a batch of data that you can then process and start to find where there are areas of improvement or consistent themes or things that you maybe need to change and that way you can go through the optimization process and find out much more about your trading as a whole. But a simulator is going to allow you to build up a lot of data. Now, as well as this account history, there was also something I showed you earlier, which is the statistics tab. So you can actually see overall what your, your stats are like um, for these different areas. I'd recommend processing your own data as well so that you can find new insights, but this is a really good thing at a glance. And as I said earlier, you can add it to the terminal in the side here so you can always keep track of how your stats are performing. And this doesn't just have to be for when you're creating your system in the first place. This same approach can be used at any point in your career to keep developing and improving. So you can collect much more data much quicker when you use a simulator and that will allow you to have a much more meaningful sample size to go through a proper optimization process. You can also test out new approaches that you might not be willing to try in the live markets and that's something that we'll discuss next. We might think that we already have an idea of how we want to trade based on our personality or preferences, or maybe it's just because we came across someone online who claimed that they were profitable, so we chose to adopt their style. But the truth is, your best trading performance will come when you find a style and approach that suits you. And the best way to figure this out is to try out different styles to see when you feel like you match well with one. Even if you still end up sticking with the original approach that you thought you were going to trade with, by going through these different styles, you'll just be adding more strings to your bow. You'll build up more implicit knowledge that will help you even in ways that you don't realize. But to do this properly, you need to commit to the different style for a significant amount of time. It sort of reminds me of when I was doing a graduate scheme after university and you do rotations around different departments in the bank so you know how the different things function, have more knowledge about them and maybe find something more suited to you. So it's the same thing here. You can do rotations across different styles of trading during your development phase before you choose on an approach to settle on. But the problem is, if you use the live markets for this, it might not actually be that beneficial. Let's say that you spend three months for each style, right? That's a significant amount of time to be using one particular style. But what if the approach only averages one trade per week? You would have taken about 12 trades in that time. How are you going to learn anything about the approach from that and know whether it's right for you or not? Or what if it's a longer term approach and you only take one or two trades during that time? That's not going to be really helpful, is it? So the solution, of course, is to use a simulator and to set out a plan for the different style rotations that you'll go through across a period of time. Maybe you'll spend two months with each style, so you can set out a schedule of the six different styles that you'll try out over the next year. You can then squeeze in years worth of trading into each of those two month periods by using a simulator instead of live markets and then you'll know much more about that approach and whether it's right for you. Let's say for example that I'm trying out a style of trading now where it's more focused on what's happening on the higher time frames. So for example here on the daily chart I'm looking for situations where I'm anticipating a bigger move on the higher time frames and I'm going to be finding entries on the lower time frames where I can keep my risk much tighter, so I have my stop loss tighter, which therefore means I have limited risk and potential for a much bigger return, but that means that I'm going to potentially be taking lots of smaller losses in the short term and then much bigger returns that overshadow that when I catch the bigger move. 
So that would mean I'm having to wait for these situations on the daily chart, like this one here, for example, and then maybe I drop down to the 15 minute chart. And this is just a really basic example to show you what I mean. Um, and let's say that I open an order and we're going to buy, let's say we're going to put a stop loss, I don't know, like here, um, and we buy. So now I have this much at risk, but I have potential to catch the bigger move on a daily. And if we press resume, okay, fantastic, massive profit. What are the chances? Um, so we can see now, okay, we've had that big move on the daily and now I can manage the trade whatever and I can see if this approach works well for me. Now, if I was going to take this approach using the real markets, then I'm going to take this one trade here or maybe it's several trades before I catch the big move. But now I have to wait until the next time that there's a potential setup on the higher time frame. If I'm only doing a rotation trading this style for the next two months, maybe that only gives me five opportunities, maybe a couple of opportunities. Although I can kind of see if this situation is going to work favorably for, for me or not, if it's a style that I'd want to stick with and if I liked the process of waiting and not having to do as much most of the time, if it fits around my work schedule well, all of that stuff. That's one aspect, okay, I can figure that out from the real markets over those two months. But I can't see whether it actually turns out to be profitable for me or not because I don't have a big enough sample size. So instead in this situation, I would do a combination of two things. I would on one hand be focusing on doing it in the live markets so I can see that process of having to wait for each trade and see if I like that or not, see if it fits around my work schedule, see if I want to be more active or not. And at the same time, be using the simulator in between to actually test these opportunities more frequently to be able to see if it's a profitable approach for me or not. So there are two aspects there. You're seeing if it suits your personality and how you want to trade. And then you're also collecting that data to be able to see if it actually works out to be profitable for you or not. And that's something you wouldn't be able to do with just the live markets on its own. And that's why a lot of traders end up taking these more active approaches because they can only test them in the live markets and they're only going to, like if they use a longer term approach, they're not going to have enough trades to actually take. But it might actually be that the more patient longer term approach is more profitable and more suited to you. So this is the only way that you can truly find that out. As I said, even if you don't find a better approach than the one that you were intending to use anyway, this is still a great way to gain more experience and level up your skill set. You're experiencing more different things, different approaches. So when you're in a tricky situation in the markets in the future, you'll have more solutions and more reference points to call upon, which is exactly what we'll be doing with the final practice type. Okay, so the last point is practicing historical scenarios. So just like we discussed earlier about practicing different scenarios, this time it's historical events. Like for example, have you ever wondered how you'd perform if you traded during the 2008 financial crisis or during the European sovereign debt crisis or various other things? Well, with a simulator, you can do exactly that. Not only is it a fun way to spice things up, but you can also see how well your approach would have worked in those different market conditions and see if you can adjust your strategies to be more suited to it. Let's go through an example of these historical scenarios using the 2020 pandemic. So we're going to focus on when it first started to hit the markets and there was a huge amount of volatility. Obviously it's affected the market since then quite a lot, but there was one point where things got really, really volatile. And in particular, I want to focus on the Dow, so US stocks. Now, it might be the case that you weren't trading back when it was the start of the pandemic, or maybe you were early in your sort of development process. And so you might want to go back and trade during that time to see how you would have performed, to watch the sort of activity that unfolded so that you can start to pick up on signs in the future. Or maybe it's that you made mistakes at the time and you want to go back and trade it again with new knowledge to approach the situation differently or maybe try different markets, different assets that you didn't try before. So there's a whole range of different reasons why you might want to go back through this particular scenario. And then in terms of the scenarios that we can use, it can either be before the onset of the volatility, during the onset of the that during the volatility being there in the market or afterwards as the volatility dies out and picking up on signs of that happening. And there's all kinds of rules and restrictions you could add to make it even more challenging. You could make it that you've got to focus on risk management. You've got to find precise entry points where you're not going to be risking much, but you could potentially grab a, a large move in the market. So basically we'll come over to new project. We're going to give it a project name of pandemic. And I think this much money is enough, 100,000. So we'll go to next. Now we're looking for US 30, which is the Dow. 
and I'm just going to focus on one minute data and the period of time that's fine for me that's going to be the amount of data that's on the screen then we go to next we're gonna have New York close the time and the start date so if we start it from 2020 and we'll go for around mid-February so let's go from like the 15th of February now I'm going to switch off start testing after creation because I don't want this the price to be or the time to be moving along once the simulator starts I'd rather be able to control that myself so we'll click create okay so it's created that simulation for us if you're using just um, one minute data it'll be fairly quick if you're using tick data as well it can take quite a while and so now what I would do is just switch to my working time frame or do my analysis however I normally would and stick to what I'm doing for this simulator session. So if we start playing it, it might even be that you decide not to actually trade, but you're just sitting there observing the movements, sort of like a session for implicit learning. It's kind of different to regular chart time. So I've said that chart time is just ordinary practice. But if you're specifically having the intention to focus on a session where you're seeing how the, the price movements differ from normal. So here, for example, if we're looking at when we're looking at steady state markets compared to when the volatility kicks in, then there's an intention to that session. You're doing it for the implicit learning and to pick up on signs of how the activity changes. You could even be taking notes about, okay, th this is what was happening. It was skipping prices and moving much quicker. Like what's happening in these moments? You could be taking notes of this, maybe even doing a screen record so you can watch it a few times over or just go back on a simulator and replay it again. Now, it might be that I actually want to trade during this. So perhaps I'm wanting to find some precise entries and maybe look at retests of previous lows and things like that. So let's say, for example, here, I'm not saying that I would enter here, but let's say that we have our analysis here, then maybe I'm going to go and open an order. And this time I want to be with really low risk because of the volatility that I know is going to be hitting the market. So we'll go, we're going to go for a buy order. We're going to put a stop loss over here and buy. It's probably going to end up hitting the stop loss because it's going to be volatile. Looks like we've just survived the stop loss dance so far. So let's say I'm looking for, you know, either it's going to hit my stop loss or I'm looking for the earliest moment that I can maybe adjust my stop loss to break even. And there we go. There's been a big gap down. So these, these sorts of situations provide good learning opportunities because it's giving you activity that you might not see in the regular markets at the moment. But at some point over your career, assuming that you're going to be trading for a long time, you'll encounter these sorts of situations. Perhaps not a pandemic again, but something that disrupts the markets. A natural disaster, um, a change in an industry, a change with uh, the status of a company if you're trading individual equities, uh, perhaps a war or some sort of change with central bank policy or a government taking some sort of action. There can be all kinds of things that can cause these disruptive moments and the more prepared for them you are, the less those moments have a risk of ruin for you. Market conditions can change rapidly, just like we saw during the pandemic. And as a trader, you need to be able to adapt your strategies and approach to these changing market conditions. Otherwise, you risk spending months sitting on the sidelines waiting for things to get back to normal. Or worse, you could be completely caught out and lose a huge amount of money. So let's take a look at another event on the charts and see how the market dynamics changed here. We'll start with the Brexit vote. And if you're not sure what Brexit is, it was a referendum held in the UK where the public got to vote on whether we stay or leave the European Union. Now, you can find the market reaction yourself if you go to the 23rd of June 2016 in the simulator. And a couple of markets that you might want to look at are pound dollar or the FTSE 100. Now, the outcome of the referendum wasn't what most people or the markets were expecting. And the reaction was quite something. Okay, so let's do a Brexit scenario here. Now, the market I want to focus on is pound dollar. That was obviously heavily affected during the referendum and after the referendum. So the first thing I want to do is come into data, go to the data center and make sure I've got that data set up. As you can see, I've got the one minute history and that's all I'm going to need for this. I'm not going to need the tick data. So if I then start a new project, we'll call this Brexit. I think with $100,000 is enough. We'll go to next, we'll come down here to pound dollar, one minute data. The testing period, this is the data that you're actually going to have inside the simulator. So I don't necessarily 
need to change this to sort of around 2016, around the time of the vote. I can keep it as 2003 because I want to have all of the historic data to be able to use as well. So if I click next, this is where it's more important to change the, the dates that we start from. So you can see it says history data before start date will be preloaded. So it's only the start date of when we begin trading rather than it being uh, like the actual data that's appearing on screen. I've got a New York close as the session close time and I'm going to go to the start date and put in 2016 and it was June and it was on the 23rd but we're going to start it from the 22nd. So I've deselected the start testing after creation because I don't want it to start moving and potentially sort of go too far into when the volatility began. I want to be trading during that period so I'd rather it starts when it's paused and we'll create that. Okay, so we have our pound dollar chart here and really how I approach this will depend on which sort of scenario I am focusing on in the session and I'd recommend just focusing on one. So it could either be that you're in a trade before the volatility hits and you've got to find a way to exit the trade appropriately or manage your risk during the event. It could be that you trade during the event itself and you're looking for entries when the volatility kicks in or it could be that you're waiting until after that event's finished and looking for the first signs that volatility has sort of come to a, something that's more reasonable and you pick up on whatever signs you have as your way of trading to know that that's the right time to start trading again. So just to show you, I'm going to just press start and if we just move the bar forward until we start to get to the 23rd. So quite a bit of clicking here. We could jump ahead like four hours at a time, obviously. That'll be an easier way to do it. But now that we've started on the one hour chart, we'll stick with this one. And now we've got into the 23rd, which is when the vote happened. And we can see now volatility starting to kick in. So if you had the tick data downloaded for this, you could actually watch the sort of movements that happen so you can see how the price moved during those moments. And this can be really good implicit learning because you're picking up on certain patterns of movements. So in future, if you start to see this volatility kicking in, you'll pick up on the signs of how the price moved during that time and realize, oh, okay, there's something going on here that I need to be cautious about. So it could be that we look to trade during that time. In that case, we'd be on the five minute chart and you can see some big movements happening there. Or it could be that from this point onwards, we're waiting for things to start to die down and for it to be sort of regular trading. Now, in these sorts of high volatility moments, something that we should be paying attention to is um, the size of the moves as well. Like it's really easy to look at relative sizes and say, okay, this looks smaller than this move here, but we also need to look at how big, how big this is in absolute terms, like how many pips this moving each time. For some reason, I've got volume there twice, so I could just come down here and close that one. Um, so that's the Brexit example. You could go through these situations and try different scenarios. So for example, one scenario might be that you're already in a trade when the markets hit that volatility and you need to manage your way out of it appropriately. Another might be that you're trying to find opportunities in that sort of activity, something I wouldn't normally recommend doing. Or you might challenge yourself to find the earliest time that you can safely start trading after the volatility of the event has died out a bit, which is all about identifying signs that that's the case. In each scenario, you're challenging yourself to adapt in a difficult situation. This is amazing implicit and explicit learning. The more restrictions and scenarios that you can give yourself around the event, the more prepared you'll be for any eventuality that might occur in future in the real markets. Because if you see similar activity happening in the markets in future, it's going to be less likely to take you by surprise and therefore you're less likely to panic or become flustered. So on screen now, you can see a list of some major events that you might choose to go through on your simulator. And there are obviously many more you could add to the list as well, but these are some good ones to get started with. And like I said, there are different scenarios that we could use for each of these different situations. So here are some examples of those as well. On the other hand, you might want to just experience different market types rather than specific events, just different types of activity. So here's a list of different market types that you can go through and the dates to put in your simulator to find those.
So I think this guide has given you more than enough to start focusing on to improve your trading. If you're a complete beginner and you're not sure where to start once you have the trading simulator set up, then check out the description box and there's a link down there to our free training. And remember down there you'll also find the link to the simulator that I recommend that you use, which is the same one that I use as well. As you can see, there are so many ways you can benefit from using a trading simulator that you wouldn't be able to do in just the live markets. I know the live markets are more exciting and fun, but there's no point trading if you're going to end up losing money. So get started on the simulator, develop your chops, and then start transitioning over to the live markets when you know you're ready for it. If you found this video helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you gave us a cheeky little thumbs up and maybe leave a comment below letting me know which part was most insightful for you. We'll be doing a lot more of these longer, more detailed guides about different things in trading. So leave a comment letting me know which areas you'd like us to focus on next. Maybe guides to particular markets, different asset classes, maybe different aspects of your trading. Let me know down below. And of course, thank you so much for watching. Take care.